In simulation, there are often multiple approaches to describing environmental controls. Let's say we have taken the first stage to dial in capacity, and the design team is considering either a VAV system or a variable temperature supply regime. To define these by way of detailed components involves a cornucopia of attributes, some investment of time and attention, as well as the sunk cost of the loser of that contest. In this video, we look at delaying investment in detail, as well as those sunk costs by transitioning by way of an ideal control representation of the system. We can then tweak their attributes to explore early stage questions, look at response patterns, and thus inform the implementation of the detailed description, and perhaps deliver some early feedback to the design team. You can find additional materials about simulation of environmental controls on the website via the link below. In the context of ESPR, I have often used thermal zones and flow networks to represent mixing boxes, ducting, and flow paths as a prelude to the transition to system components. To use virtual air movement to represent physical air movement has a pleasant symmetry. An example is the mix of spaces in this office model with mixing boxes in the ceiling void that are controlled to deliver specific temperatures and humidities. And then we let the airflow network take care of the delivery and return of the air. Of course, at this stage, the model is not attempting to do duct design. If I was rather more concerned about what was happening in the ceiling void, say the impact of poorly lagged duct work, I could up the model resolution and treat the ductwork itself as a series of thermal zones. And although I have used such approaches many times, there's still the need to dial in the capacities, flow rates, and tune the flow and mixing box controls. That takes time. Could I save time by first checking out one of the built-in controls within the ESPR, which is designed to represent such an error-based environmental control. Let's find out. For the utterly geeky, this control is implemented in the source ebuild bcfunk.f source code of ESPR as subroutine bcl08. We can find out how the sausage is made. And yes, this code is decades old, and it probably was part of some Monday's PhD. However, it gives us a clue as to the magnitude of heating and cooling from a fixed airflow within a limited temperature band. And it does so with limited inputs from the user. And if you want to find out how it's making decisions during the simulation, it also includes a trace function. Here's a short portion of such a trace file a few moments after the heating set point has been reset from 15 degrees to 20 degrees. So it's having to run at its maximum heating temperature. And the heat carried by that warmed air is, well, less than the capacity that we might be wanting to use in other rooms, so we might expect a slow response. And some hours later, the trace indicates a lower supply temperature. Back to our dozen zone office model, where we are going to focus on zones that relate to variable temperature supply. So we have the base case room, which is in the corner. It's our standard reference. We have a variable supply room, which essentially is identical to that, um, except with a different control. And we have another zone, which is going to have a slightly different definition of a variable temperature regime. If we look in controls, here's one definition of variable supply. And the period data basically sets out the few attributes which are 
the heating and cooling set point. This is the overnight with the maximum supply temperature for heating of 35 degrees, minimum supply temperature for cooling of 10 degrees, and an airflow rate, which is equivalent to five air changes per hour. I have a, an additional alternative control. has slightly different details. It's uh, five degrees warmer on the supply side, but also not quite so extremely cold for the cooling side to give us a chance to see what is different. So if I go into simulation and I choose a winter period with five minute time steps. Now I could go with two minutes, but this particular control type is not so sensitive to that sort of timing. And ask for an integrated simulation. And let's watch what happens in the base case room as well as these two other rooms and start the simulation. And we see it progressing through here, and the Saturday is a shorter day. We've got two different sense conditions. The upper line is for the base case room, um, and the other is the air temperature, uh, is the control point for the variable supply rooms. So let's save those results and go and look in detail. So if I choose the zones, base case, variable supply, and its alternative, focus on that, go into graphs, parameter plot, plot the temperatures, as well as the resultant temperature and the heat hue cooling applied in that. I will adjust so we can see that um, the turquoise line, um, alt bars, has slightly greater capacity in terms of heating. That extra five degrees helps us out. Otherwise, we see in terms of air temperature um, that um, it does struggle a bit to get up to temperature. Why would that be? Because ambient temperature on the outside is varying. And if I also add in direct solar, yes. So these periods, these peaks are related to solar. If I change my tension from graphs to uh, inquire about, I can look at statistics of the actual energy delivered. So the additional capacity in uh, the alternate room means that I have uh, purchased more energy along the way. And if I look at the summary statistics in terms of temperatures inside, 
slightly cooler than the old Vars rooms. The minimum is a bit more. There's a slight difference between mean value in those different rooms. So now I could consider whether or not um, I need to increase the airflow rate, increase the supply temperature, or look at uh, improving the fabric of the building. With very little input, I've been able to uh, get some useful information 